Salutations respective viewers, this is George from Ireland and I'm going to continue my series for A-level history about Germany and the Weimar Republic. So, uh, 1919 and uh, Germany was still coping with the shock of uh, defeat in the Great War, or as it was called at the time, the First World War as we tend to say now. Um, it was very difficult to accept that all that suffering had been for nothing. There was scarcely a family who hadn't had at least one of its men killed. Uh, as I pointed out, many civilians had died of starvation. Others were severely uh, emaciated from uh, the blockade when allied countries had not allowed food into Germany. Uh, the Royal Navy stopped ships bringing food to Germany and so forth. Of course, uh, German U-boats that submarines had sunk ships bringing foods to other, to other countries. Um, it was very hard to take that all this um, anguish and pain had been in vain. Um, thinking back to the First World War, uh, people from allied countries like the United Kingdom, often they think of this as, as a dreadful massacre and focus only on the uh, pain that people experienced. And people in the UK don't seem to remember it as a victory. Imagine how much harder it would be uh, if that had actually been for a defeat if all that suffering had been for nothing to make the situation even worse than before, for the country to be derided and detested by the rest of the world. Um, so that's why it was very hard for Germans to come to terms with um, all this suffering having been completely in vain. Anyway, so for liberals and leftists, it could be a moment of optimism. They saw there was an opportunity to refashion Germany as a democracy for the very first time. Previously, it, um, the, the Reichstag had been the fig leaf hiding the nakedness of absolutism. As um, Wilhelm Liebknecht had said, the Reichstag uh, didn't really have power. Um, Germany had been in the iron grip of a military aristocratic uh, complex, and th this grasp could be broken for the first time. Germany could develop social justice, concentrate on uh, to, um, building fantastic uh, public services, and a newfound respect for the rule of law and civil liberty, and no longer being a chauvinistic uh, state, be satiated, no longer seeking to conquer more territory. So it was the dawning of a new era, and uh, left-wingers were, were full of hope. Um, for the far left, this seemed to be a golden opportunity for a revolution and bring about the total transformation of society, such as it was taking place in Russia at that time under the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were soon to rename themselves the Communists, and they eyed uh, the uh, accomplishments, as they saw it, of the Bolsheviks in Russia with admiration. Some people wanted to bring home the revolution to Germany, pointing out that Marxism, as communism, was invented by a German, Karl Marx. Um, anyway, so uh, let's uh, concentrate a bit more on the uh, nature of the Weimar Republic. Um, it only lasted for 15 years, and during this time the Chancellorship changed hands 16 times. So on average they last less than a year. That doesn't mean there were 16 different individuals. Sometimes a person served more than once as chancellor. That's the equivalent of um, prime minister. The composition of the government changed even more frequently than that. Because remember, remember there were coalitions when two or more parties shared office because no single party could command a majority in the Reichstag. The head of state was the president. He was elected by a popular vote not an electoral college. People alluded to him as the ersatz emperor, like an inadequate replacement, because they didn't have a real emperor, the Kaiser. The political system was very democratic, perhaps too democratic. Um, the proportional representation was um, used, as I've pointed out previously. Anyway, some right-wingers, uh, they pined for the stability of the old system. They were nostalgic. Everything was much better under the Kaiser. Um, the Weimar Republic faced many severe problems that um, Germany hadn't had under the Kaiser simply because prior to 1918 Germany had not suffered a shattering defeat. And there were many uh, attempts by left-wingers and right-wingers to overthrow the Weimar Republic and it, um, it started out with the bitter inheritance of defeat. So um, the German government sent a delegation to Versailles, that's a palace near Paris, to because the Treaty of Versailles was being negotiated. However, Germany was not allowed to negotiate. The Allies discussed amongst themselves what terms they were going to impose on Germany. The Germans were there simply as observers. The Allies chose this venue, Versailles, because 
It was a huge complex of buildings and many diplomats and politicians were there. Um, moreover, it was near Paris and France had been the scene of the crucial battles on the Western Front. Uh, furthermore, in, 19, sorry, in 1871, when Germany defeated France, it was in the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, the unification of Germany had been proclaimed and the German Emperor had been proclaimed. So for the French, it was a bittersweet moment to rub Germany's nose in it that uh, the French were the masters now. Anyway, June 1919, the Allies finally thrashed out the terms that they're going to impose on Germany. It was peace by diktat. The big four were there, Vittorio Orlando, the Italian Prime Minister, but he left right before the signing, actually. Um, the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George, uh, the American President, Woodrow Wilson, and the French Prime Minister, Georges Clemenceau. Um, in fact, Wilson was um, severely ill for much of this time, confined to his rumour that that wasn't reported by the press at the time. People even feared he might die. He actually died four years later. Um, so I think this is often underestimated by people. One of the reasons why the United States didn't get its way in Versailles so much was partly because the president was gravely ill. Um, and indeed, the United States did not ratify Versailles. Uh, the US Congress refused to say, we accept this. But anyway, um, the Allies had their terms. Various other countries sent representatives like South Africa and um, Canada. Remember, France and the United Kingdom had many colonies in Asia and Africa, and a few of them sent representatives like India, but the Indian representative was simply there on the orders of the British government. So um, I won't go into the terms of it just yet, but Germany is told you must sign or face immediate renewal of the war. Um, and that's obviously the uh, default position if somebody refuses to sign a um, peace agreement. Remember the arm armistice? the 11th of November 1918 was a temporary cessation of hostilities whilst the permanent peace was being hammered out. So Germany was in no fit state to fight on because as part of the armistice in November 1918, Germany had, had to retreat back into its own territory to leave French and Belgian territory, to release allies of prisoners of war. The Germans were already prisoners of war in 1918, were kept in. Germany had, had to hand over so much artillery, machine guns, merchant ships even. Um, the Allies had a stronger position, Germany had a weaker position. The Royal Navy had maintained the blockade of Germany in June, till June 1919. Technically, the Allies were still at war with Germany, so Germany was still suffering severe hardship and hunger. So the position was utterly hopeless for Germany, and the orders came back from Berlin to the German delegation, you just sign, because we cannot fight. And so the German delegation um, made a formal protest, we are doing this, under duress, but okay, there's our signature. So that was that, the war was officially over. Um, anyway, the treaty imposed uh, severe restrictions on the German armed forces. There would have no U-boats, that's submarines, no airplanes whatsoever. You couldn't find a 20th century war without planes. No poison gas, only six battleships, all those of a limited size. Six cruisers, only 12 destroyers, that's the type of warship. Loss of 13% of Germany's uh, territory. Um, uh, let me see, the Saarland was temporarily taken by um, uh, France. It was going to have a plebiscite after 15 years to decide whether to remain part of France or revert to Germany. The principle of reparations was decided. Think of the etymology, like repair. Germany is going to have to repair, pay for all the damage that it had caused. Well, this is linked to Clause 231, the War Guild Clause, that Germany was fully and solely responsible for starting the war. Now. It's not entirely fair. I mean, the number of governments should bear some of the blame, not exclusively Germany, primarily Germany, perhaps. Um, now, it does seem unfair, the very concept of national guilt. No one's bad or indeed good by being born to a particular nationality. But anyway, um, a huge amount of damage had been caused, not to say the deaths of roughly 16 million people, and the damage had to be put right. Someone had to pay who was going to pay. Some people say this was victor's justice. It was simply because the Allies won, they were doing this, and it had nothing to do with fairness. Well, the South African Prime Minister, Jan Christian Smuts, said it was a Carthaginian peace, like when the Romans had uh, vanquished Carthage uh, 22 centuries before, um, and simply razed the city and sowed it with salt, as in some think nothing would grow there again. But that's uh, a huge exaggeration. Uh, the Allies didn't occupy most of Germany, didn't ruin its industry or anything. The Germans had to accept the principle that they were going to pay for the damage. The actual amount was not fixed at that stage. The, um, anyway, 
So throughout this year, Germany had been teetering on the brink of outright civil war. Even though it didn't quite come to that, there was a very high level of political violence, hundreds of political assassinations by uh, communists and by the ultra-right killing each other. That's enough for the moment.